Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm your host, Kevin Lee. And today, we have a very special guest with us. He's an expert in growth, marketing, and content, with an incredible 15 years of experience across multiple industries, including finance, marketing, and customer experience strategy. Jesse is the founder and managing director of Ooze Studios, an award-winning Australian creative and marketing agency. With a vision to create leaner and more effective marketing campaigns and digital products, Jesse assembled the remarkable Ooze Studios digital creative team. Over the past seven plus years, they've been delivering ROI-focused ads and content to a wide range of clients and industries. But it's not just about the clients for Jesse and his team at Ooze Studios. They're on a mission to deliver the best agency experience in the world. And that starts with the people behind the scenes. Ooze Studios implements large corporate culture programs at a boutique agency level, ensuring that each team member has a unique career development program, complete with hard skill development courses and soft skill mentoring sessions. Jesse believes that the heart of their success lies in their people, and their culture is the core of their vision. Without an amazing, talented team, they wouldn't be able to achieve the incredible things they have. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Jesse Mullins. <laughs> Hey, Jesse, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Mate, thank you for making the time. Had a few hiccups earlier, but we finally got to schedule and here we are. Here we are indeed. Mate, let's start with your journey. Let's share about why and how you started your studios for the audience. Can we get into that? Absolutely. Look, so launched it eight years ago whilst working full time. And look, every time someone starts to answer a question like, why did you start the business that you founded? They'll say things like, because I wanted to help people and things like that, which I, I did as well as a big important factor for me because I'm quite a big empath. I wanted to help people, but there's also selfish reasons, right? There's also like reasons behind the selflessness and the ultra, ultra wistic. And ultimately I'm a fiercely independent human. I've always been like that. My, my parents brought me up to be like that. And that's driven my desire to start my own business. So there's this like, yeah, fierce independence and also combined with, I wanted to create an amazing culture. So I've been a part of some very bad cultures. I've been part of some great cultures, but they all had optimizations that, they could, that could happen upon them. And so I, I wanted to, yeah, push culture innovation in a new way and when I want, and so we got that at the core of it combined with a vehicle such as marketing services. That's where I saw a gap in the market where I could be compassionate and empathetic to the clients, which a lot of marketing agencies are not. And I also do the same for the people, for the team members. And so that, that's where I saw a gap in the market because ultimately when you launch a business, you need to be, you need to have a competitive advantage. And that's where I saw oozes competitive advantage. The fact that, again, very easy to say that we'd have a care factor, but I felt that we could have true compassion and empathy for our clients and we could really care for the results and really care ultimately their financial well-being because that's what marketing is all about, driving results and driving revenue through the door. But ultimately it's the selflessness, but the selfish reason is that I'm fiercely independent and I want to say I'm a control freak, but I certainly like to be in control of my own destiny. And so that, that's yeah. what spawned, that's what spurned this. And I'm curious, how has your upbringing or previous experience influenced your decision to start this year? Because yeah, you, you speak a lot about being empath and fiercely independence. And so I'm curious about that part of the story. Look, I had a bit of a, I suppose, unusual childhood. So both my parents, ex-hippies, my mum's been a painter, as in like artist painter all of her life for 50 years. Dad was a theatre director, moved into events, but both hippie at the core. And so up until the age of nine, my childhood was like going, like running through forests and picking asparagus, and the, like wild asparagus. And that was our entertainment, no Nintendo, no, no Game Boy, nothing like that back in the day. And so we were, I truly believe that had a very strong impact where I was allowed to make decisions at an early age about what I could do for fun. And I think that freedom that they gave me allowed me to become the person I am today. So I think that correlation between parental style and fierce independence is very correlated. Now, did I have it as part of my genes because both my parents are fiercely independent? Look, likely, right? And then we could start this whole debate around nurture versus nature, of which I've, I read a report 
a, a, not a report, a medical study around, they looked at 26 identical twins that were separated at birth and they analyzed how much of their behaviors were nurture versus nature. And it, the conclusion was that it's actually a 50, 50. So 50% 50 of our behaviors mm. and our personality come from nurture and the other come from nature. So what does that tell you? You can overcome bad genes, but also bad parenting or good parenting has a profound effect. There goes your, and this is such an interesting upbringing, growing up in the wild, running around, picking up asparagus and this and that. It's, I could see how that would, would have shaped you as an individual being free to, to roam around and make your own decisions and do things. And they're both very creative as well. So I can, obviously you're creative yourself. So adds that 50% into your gene and you've nurtured, used the environment to nurture that too. That, so to, to that point, I ended up going down the maths and f physics route. So then I use, so then there's, I don't know really where it came from. I think grandparents had some logic in, in their personality traits. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah, I ended up studying maths at uni and have this very strong analytical background and analytical mindset. But again, that there is this want to be creative, but my creative skills are more, are not with drawing design, the actual finer details. It's more around ideas, creating ideas, pulling different concepts together and merging it and creating in that sense rather than the detail, which again, is, I can see the correlation with the genes and the upbringing, but it's interesting that I didn't, I wasn't like good with my, essentially I'm not good with my hands. I'm good with my, my, my mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's even more interesting that you, you know, the, your family's come from a very, how is it like a more traditional art space in terms of like theater and arts and painting, whereas you're, you've gone down the route and you went into maths and physics. And so the kind of Lee segues into a great part. And through our previous emails, you've intrigued me with the concept of combining data and empathy for effective marketing. And I think that's where your unique ability of co combining the two really shines. Can you expand on this for us, please? Absolutely. So something that we've been doing at work for the last year is what we refer to as empathy experiments. And so we got the idea from Albert Einstein's thought experiments where he would vocally, he and his colleagues would vocally play out scenarios of complex theoretical physics situations because they couldn't run that particular experiment because it's too theoretical. And so they would have these out aloud open dialogue of step by step what would happen in this scenario. And so what we did is we applied that kind of concept to marketing strategies. And so how could we connect with the audience more? And so using what we refer to as empathy experiments, where I know it sounds hippy dippy, cheap, weird, but you get pretty much a group of three of you. The three of you do really deep research into the audience. So you're not coming in cold. You're coming in with some idea about what the audience, who the audience is, what they do. And you close your eyes, the three of you, and one person will go through that person's day. And so they're like, it's 7 a.m. I've woken up. I'm feeding the kids. I'm in a rush because I need to go to my professional service job, whatever. Just going through that. And then as you're building up, you're working towards this point of the day where you're encountering a problem that the product or the service that you're trying to market encounters. And so you are putting yourself in the shoes of the audience. And that's a really important part when it comes to marketing is ultimately you're effectively trying to communicate. So it's not just about selling, like it's about conveying a message on a one-to-one -one scale. Sorry, you're trying to do a one-to-one -one message on a huge scale, right? So you're trying to do it to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, but you're trying to do it on a one-to-one -one level. And so the more one-to-one -one you can connect with someone, the better. So that's where that, that empathy can play a really important role because when you break down a campaign, there are basically four parts to it and in this order. There's the audience selection, there's the message or the ads, there's the landing page, I the destination, and then there's the conversion event. So the conversion event can be something as simple as buying a product or completing a form, or it could be a certain amount of time spent on the page to absorb the brand or the content, whatever it is, like there's a conversion event. And so that empathy really helps you drive that connection to the audience and the selection of the audience. Because the more narrow your audience is, the more personalized you can make that journey and the more 
better connected you can make the audience to the ad, to the landing page, to conversion event. And then just by the very nature of that connection, your conversion rate increase. Yes, right. that makes sense. Yes. So I'm going to try to wrap my head around this in going through the visualization piece. So do your, so are you, is that the empathy piece where you're kind of putting yourself or in the position of the customer running through their day to understand, okay, this is what they're going through. This is what's happening. And they're making decisions based upon that data. Exactly. So not so much data because it's at the end of the day, it's our own subjective viewpoint of what that, that customer or audience member will do in that particular instance, but it really helps to, to embody what they're doing at that particular moment. But instead of just going straight to that moment, you actually start to build up to that moment. And then, so that, that helps you with that audience selection. And then the data part really helps with the optimization of all campaigns, as well as understanding understanding what parts of the campaign are working and which ones are not. And because if you just focus on the empathy and you don't get it right, or there's tweaks to be made, you're never going to be able to make that better. Essentially gotcha. the empathy is where you want to start and the data is how you want to become better. Understood. Understood. Yes. That's a, an interesting perspective. The visualization piece, I, I, I love doing that practice in terms of for my own regular practice of visualization like during my meditation and stuff like that. But when you talk about marketing, a lot of people create like avatars or something that are the kind of customer base that they do, but that's a very, I guess, a surface level. There's not that much empathy in terms of understanding it. It's a, they ask a few questions, put it out, build upon that character. But I think the visualization piece allows you to feel a lot more of what is possibly going through. It. There's no 100%, but at least it gets you a bit closer to there. Exactly. I was listening to an old Sam Harris podcast where he pretty much spent an hour and a half to two hours talking with this professor about the difference between empathy and compassion. And so this professor's, I forget, I forget from what uni he's from, but he had a very strong conviction that actually empathy was very dangerous because empathy didn't have, it didn't, it allowed you to connect with people, but not feel pity for them. Not pity is the wrong word, but not allow you to feel basically compassion. Whereas compassion is not about necessarily the connectivity and be able to put yourself in their shoes, but it's about feeling for them. It's about actually wanting good for their well-being, which I thought was a very interesting take. And we try and do, we try and cater for both, trying to connect, connect trying to create that connection, create that link, but then also feel yep. compassionately. What would they feel like at that moment? What, how, how can we ensure that they are reaching their aspirations? So in this case, you guys are striving for more compassion than empathy. Would you say that? I, I don't see, I'd say both. So I don't necessarily agree hundred percent with that professor's definition, but I think it is mm. important to highlight the fact that it's not just about putting yourself in their shoes. It's about putting yourself in their shoes and feeling what they're feeling. So because when some people say empathy, they just think about connection rather than connection and shared feeling. Okay. We're going to change gears a little bit. Let's have a chat about connecting company values and principles to vision and mission. Why is this important? It's hugely important. So look, before 18 months ago, we, I think we were like a lot of companies. We had a set of values and principles. We had a mission, vision, purpose. We had team goals, individual KPIs that we, we had all these, what we refer to as company asset, non-tangible asset. But they weren't connected, they weren't aligned. And so what we did is that we figured out, okay, how does everything connect? Because what became apparent is mission, vision, purpose talks about the macro. It talks about, it describes the company. It doesn't describe the individual. Whereas the values and principles describe the individual. And so if you think about like a target, the actual target logo where it's just a bunch of discs going smaller and smaller inwards, almost like a dartboard. At the very, very outer edge, you've got your vision. You've got your singular macula, macro target that shouldn't be achievable. Like it should be so aspirational that classic example is if you're a space travel company, your vision shouldn't be to reach the moon because once you reach the moon, 
what's next? Your vision should be to explore space in a economical way, or whatever, right? Something where it is actually not achievable, but continues, but pushes you to strive towards that goal. Then you got your mission, essentially, how do you get to that vision? Purpose, why do you get up in the morning to achieve that vision, right? So just going smaller and smaller. And then you've got your culture at the center of that culture drives from within outwards. But what is culture, right? Then so you go, you almost do a, an inward zoom. And then below that, you've got, you've got your goals. So your team goals, your individual goals. Then you've got your principles. Your principles essentially define, sorry, yeah, they define some guidelines for how to be an amazing ooze team member. Below that, values define who we are as Ooze team members. And then at the very core of it, it's people. And so suddenly what you've done is that you've connected your micro to your macro. So you've gone all the way from the person, the individual human, through to values, principles, goals, culture, purpose, vision. And so that's, and so connecting them creates this, this amazing alignment where as soon as we did that, everyone just clicked and we all had this very clearly communicated understanding of who we are, how we get to where we want to be, how we get to where we want to go, sorry, and where do we want to go. I think that's a beautiful thing to get everyone rowing in the same direction and in sync. I think that going from such a macro to the micro and being able to really tie that in and a part of it sounds obvious. It's like you want everyone to go in the same direction and do their thing together, but it's so difficult to actually do. It's, a, it's such a challenge from the business to be able to get everyone to do that. Whereas, but if you clearly lay out, like you've said, and gotten everyone through each part of the disc and so they can understand it's easier for them to follow through. And with you saying like mission, vision, purpose, I think these, if you look it up, you can differentiate them and start putting it together. Goals, values, principles, I understand. The one thing that I often try to dig into is culture because it's a very ambiguous term to me. And that, how do you guys define culture or how do you guys work on culture? Um, so, so, curious. so for me, culture is that really important glue between the micro and the macro. So it's that thing, it's that non-tangible thing that connects the organization to the individual and it becomes a really important element of a successful company and it's something that has become very widely spoken about very widely understood but i think very badly put into practice a lot of people see it as a checkbox not as a driving force it should be a really really important part of decision making and ultimately it should be an important part of leaders' decision making, not just managers, et cetera. The, to go maybe go back a step and also answer this question is that every year in May, we do a group, a, a set of group workshops where we work together to ask the questions, is our mission, vision, purpose still aligned to us as individuals, as a team and to the organization? So it is not just a handful of people dictating this to everyone. It is a group discussion. It is a co-decision and a co-creation workshop. And that's something that we're starting to really explore and really push next year around co-leadership. And underneath that, you've got co-decision making, co-creation, collaboration, if you will. And so really exploring, yeah, that, that not top to bottom decision making, but bottom up, actually. But so how do we define culture? Look, yeah. Very hard to define culture. Ultimately, there's a bunch of different metrics that you can use to measure it, but they need to come from a voluntary aspect. We have a lot of, we have a lot of weekly social elements to our, to our work. So as an example, every morning at 8 a.m. is the morning huddle where we all get together and we spend the first 15 minutes answering what we refer to as a question of the day. So someone from the group will pose a question and it's supposed to be random, supposed to be inquisitive. So recent ones are like, if you were to be a piece of furniture, what piece of furniture would you be and why? Through to, if you were to be on a desert island tomorrow, what would you take with you? You know, that one, one item. 
And it just, it's really interesting to see different people's different answers. And I'm a firm believer that, that everybody is interesting. You just need to ask the right questions. And we have some e introverts in, in, in our team. And this is a really interesting exercise for them to talk openly about not necessarily themselves and their feelings, but certainly to think outside the box in a public way. But it's been yeah. their social element. That, that's the most important part because it starts the day off with everyone connecting in a new way every single day. And that forms a really important part of our culture. Then on Thursday afternoon, every single week, we have a quiz where someone creates a quiz. Wednesday lunch, we have social learning lunch where we watch a masterclass or something together. And that's not including any, any monthly big social event we might have or any other social events like those things i just mentioned were the fixed things every week that's an interesting uh, layout you got there and i can see that all these bits and pieces that you're putting together form the culture and they connect whether it's socially or through education or through development and that kind of links together what your values are then your principles and your vision it kind of all ties in and like you're saying that becomes then the glue between the macro and the micro and to further with this, I know that Ooze has its own career development program. Since we're talking about the topic of staff, I'd love to for you to go into this and if you could pro possibly share even the hard and soft skill identification tools that you talk about or even setting short, medium and long-term goal tracking, stuff like that. Absolutely. So th this actually comes back to values and principles I was talking about earlier. So what we've essentially done is that we've, uh, I've, is that we've identified the three values and three principles that every Ooze team member should embody. Again, going back to the values is describes who we are, principles describes how we should behave. And from this, we, we've created what we refer to as the Ooze integration tracker. So this is where each principle and value has three characteristics. So that's 18 characteristics. So six times three. 18. And then each characteristic has got a bunch of statements attached to it, one, two, or three. So what we have essentially is we have 50 odd statements that describe what it is to be an awesome human being. That's what we cheesily describe it. And so we get them to self-review, so score themselves out of five with all these statements. And what this does is that it really helps isolate soft skill development areas. Because it's typically quite hard to identify where to start with soft skills. I want to be a better communicator. Okay. That's so broad. Can we dig further into that? And then it can become a bit sticky because there's no specific examples that either mentor and or individual can come up with. So we, we find this self analysis tracker, this, this self analysis tool, which they use once a month and they can see how they're progressing creates a really good identification process for which soft skill to develop. With the hard skill, we have what we refer to as a task tracker. So that is directly aligned to their profile description. So each profile description doesn't focus on responsibilities because they're abstract. They're something that someone should be, yeah, they're basically too in intangible. And so we actually break it down into tasks, like regular tasks, ad hoc tasks. And then we essentially track their progress on each of those tasks which again, when you look at task tracker and what we refer to as the integration tracker, that forms a really important part of their career development because we can identify both hard skill and soft skill for them to develop. So that's the, that, that's, I suppose, at the core of that identification process. And so each person has a mentor and some, there's two mentors, myself and Diane, and we meet with our mentees weekly, not quarterly, not monthly. It's really important to meet with the individual weekly to essentially be that hands-on guide for them. Because without that, there's too much of a time gap. You allow too much autonomy and most people get distracted too easily. And so we find this really hands-on well-being touch point, mentoring touch point, career development touch point to be really effective. But there's a really important point that I wanted to talk about. So there's, yeah, goal setting. So when it comes to goal setting, so we use the, these trackers to identify the two or three big areas for development. Then we work with the individual. Okay, Kevin, so where do you want to be in 30 days? What does Kevin in 30 days look like? What do you want him to be or be doing differently than he is now? And okay, so from that, we've created some short-term goals. 
And then we break that down even further. Okay, so what do you need to do today and this week to be able to help you get to that Kevin in 30 days? And again, like really breaking it down into micro or minute daily habits to then help you achieve that 30 day target. And sometimes out of the tracker analysis, the optimizer, sorry, not the optimization, the task tracker and integration tracker, so the soft skill and hard skill trackers will come medium term goals, which are three month goals. And so there'll be this cycle of meeting weekly to help you achieve those short term goals, which are then going to help you achieve your medium term goals. And then I suppose coming back to a bigger picture in January, we set their 12 month goals. So new year, new you, what do you want to achieve? Let's do a, ret a retrospective. Where do you want to be in 12 months? And we'll help them isolate one, two or three at most goals. And so that th there's always this interconnectivity between the micro and the macro. What are you doing today? What are you doing tomorrow to help you achieve or help you become that person you want to be in 30 days, 90 days and 365 days from now? Wow. Okay. So that was a lot to unpack there. It starts to get a lot because of all the different tools and trackers that you guys use. And they're all internal tools that you've built. Um, but I can see how effective that would have been to really clarify and make crystal clear through questioning process, through the mentoring process, through sitting down individually and setting these 30 day targets and three month goals and 12 month goals. Having that sort of structure really gives somebody the clarity and direction of where they're going and say, okay, at any point in time, they know what they need to do or where they need to refer back to. Because that's the challenge in some workplaces, right? It's like really working, but yeah, your rough idea or the North Star kind of changes constantly. <laughs> You're putting a bit of a predicament of what am I actually doing or where, what am I actually working towards? So I can see that's quite a unique kind of structure and framework you've put in for the team there. Good to see you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to add that what the role the mentor is in, in this whole thing is to be the guide and to be supportive, but also to really help them work out what are the, what's that fine balance between an aspirational goal as well as an achievable goal. Because if the individual keeps on setting completely aspirational goals that are not achievable, they're going to become deflated. They're not going to, they're not going to progress. But at the same time, if they're purely achievable, but not very aspirational, they're not going to be very hungry to achieve them. So it's a very fine balance between those two factors. And that's where experience as well as a good mentor, I think comes into it. I think it's important to have a mentor regardless of whatever industry or work you are doing. And that really helps with progression. And I don't think we have enough of it around or have the right mentors that can and uh, help us on our journey. And those of us who've had the luck to have a good mentor always attribute their level of success or their level, the catalyst of their results or progression to their mentor, no doubt. Agree. And COVID is still rampant where we're living and it's had another wave. A lot of staff, although the offices are back open, many are still working remotely at least a few days a week. And how is U Studios breaking the barriers to efficient and meaningful remote working? Great question. It's something that we put a lot of time effort and effort into. And I think the, the gamble that I took, come over exactly when, two, yeah, two years ago, when we only had five full-time employees, I hired a culture leader, which I, I think is quite unusual for such a small company. Usually people do that a lot later stage. And I think it's paid dividends. We had, we've had a very strong focus on this culture. We've had someone dedicated to building and developing it. And that really helped us during COVID. That, that helped us with making sure everyone's well being was well looked after and was a major focus of our leadership decisions and our culture programs. And so ultimately we be, being very focused on again, like just going back a step to, to refer to the earlier being empathetic and compassionate. You know, if I was an employee in this situation, what would I want? And so we're continually asking for feedback, continually engaging within individuals as well as teams and the whole organization, finding out how do we provide the best agency experience in the world, which is actually our vision. Our, our vision is to provide the best digital agency experience in the world for both client and team member. And so having that at 
the very core of everything we do, I think, really help drive these programs that I've already mentioned. Like a, a, another one is every Thursday for half an hour to 45 minutes on, on Thursday morning, there's what we refer to as a training Q&A. So everyone gets together, the whole company, and people share what they've learned that week. And so we, you know, we have designers, developers, marketers, copywriters, all different skill sets, all different mindsets. And the cross learning is amazing. Like when you see people being inspired by other learning, others and their learning, it's a really fruitful exercise. And again, s some leaders and managers will see that, could see that as a potential waste of 45 minutes times the number of employees as a cost to it. But trust me, that if you think like that, and purely like that, yeah, you're not really thinking about culture. You're just thinking about the bottom mm. line. Now, don't get me wrong. Now, I that I, I know how that sounded. I know that sounded like quite hippy dippy, like <laughs> free love to everyone, free holidays to all. Right? You obviously need to have a business case. You obviously need to think practically. But experiment. That's what we did. Some things worked. Some things didn't. Like another thing we did, we did for over a three month period every week was, sorry, every fortnight was have stuff up meetings. So I, I got this idea from a, a co-working space night called F ups where on, on entrepreneurs would come in and they talk about pu publicly to a group about stuff up and what they learned from, et cetera. So we bought that in house and we really want to create a culture where it was okay to make a mistake. It's totally fine. We're human. The more you talk about it, the more yeah, the more okay people will be with it. And especially, and that was actually really important with this hybrid slash remote work culture, right? Because suddenly we've moved from being next to each other. There, there's an automatic, not micromanagement, but there's an automatic viewpoint to be able to look after people and check if they're okay, if they're making mistakes, things like that. And they're moving to completely remote where you're not next to them. And suddenly there's this heightened requirement for trust. And that they're going to report a mistake, that they're not going to just hide a mistake or just not report it at all. So by infusing this idea that mistakes are fine, that mistakes happen, that it's better to talk about a mistake and actually everyone around you is making mistakes or has made a mistake. And so it becomes a normal part of conversation, which means people talk about it, which means that you can deal with them quicker. That's a very interesting concept in terms of yeah, creating that kind of meeting for allow people to share their mistakes. Because it's shunned quite a bit in, in typical culture, work culture. Because you may just like, oh no, like, how do I cover it up? I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to, they don't want to be open about it because it, there's repercussions and it shouldn't be made to be felt like that. It should be openly, okay, if there's a stuff up, then, you know, openly be transparent about it so that you can work as a team to get past it rather than feel like you have to hide it or make it a bigger problem. So I think it's almost exacerbating as well to not exacerbating though. It's, I think it's, what's the term? It's almost cathartic to be able to share and open up and let people know about that. And so I'm curious to hear, you've had a culture leader now for what, two years or so. What are one or two insightful lessons that you've learned after hiring a culture leader? So something okay. that we, that was very interesting that we found that from a survey, a set of survey questions Diane created was what do team members value the most? So if we want to reward them for great work, that they win a quiz, that they, well, we've got, as an example, we've got the quarterly quiz winner, right? So every quarter, the best quiz gets voted as the winner and you get a reward, right? But so what is that reward? So companies very easily dish out vouchers, but is that really what they want? We asked the question, do you want time off? Do you want cash value? Do you want vouchers? Do you want, do you want public recognition? Do you want a badge? What is it that really actually the individual values most? And funny enough, it was cash. Give me cash, that's, man. That's yeah. all I want. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's not a, and I totally get that. I totally respect that. I like. Would I want cash over a voucher? Yes, because I want to be able to choose where I spend it. I don't want you to tell me where I need to spend it. And do I want time off? I feel has enough time off that they could clearly that they prefer the cash. So we changed our rewards to to meet that. And it wasn't just like a sixty percent trend; it was like a ninety five, a hundred percent trend. 
um, that people want to cash as their reward. Interesting insight. Thank right. you. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. I think a lot of my staff would prefer the extra cash as well. I think it's a big driver at the moment. Jesse, you shared with me previously that you love brainstorming or what you refer to as live open research techniques. How does this process differ from traditional brainstorming? So what we've been exploring is how, like, how do you teach a junior or a non-experienced leader how to make better decisions? And so we started to really break this down into, there's really two major pivot points in the decision process. One is generating ideas and two is, gen is choosing the best idea. So when digging further into Harvard Business Review and Inc and all like these big publications, there's a clear pattern in terms of what's referred to as open research techniques and closed research techniques. And so open techniques is where you essentially, you almost got like a funnel and you're trying to get as many relevant ideas into the pool as possible. And so that's where you'll have an open brainstorming session where no idea is a bad idea. You get everyone to do research before they come to the meeting and they discuss ideas. And that's where you might really almost like idea collecting. Then closed brainstorming or uh, sorry, closed research techniques or which closed brainstorming is one is where you're, you're, you're narrowing your focus. You're taking the pool and you're isolating the one idea that you want to choose. And so both have different objectives that the second one, the closed one is where you start to think about practicalities and where actually you need to deselect ideas because they're impractical or they don't meet that risk versus reward equation. And as a side point, something that we've been exploring is like, how do you teach a junior or a non-leadership individual how to calculate risk versus reward? And that's something that, that we're actively exploring and we're looking to implement in January. But going back to these techniques, so something like a closed, a closed technique, for instance, is playing the devil's advocate. Right. So you have one person in the room that's the customer or that's the competitor or that's just an opposing viewpoint. And so they will be there in the room to think differently, to push the idea in a different way, to essentially close the idea down. And you then have to surpass those arguments. That's how you then narrow the focus. Another one is what we refer to is a question burst. So we will, so an individual's got a problem, but they're, they're trying to make a decision. They go into a room of non, they don't have to be relevant to the particular expertise. So the designer can go to marketers, copyrights, developers and go, look, I've got this problem. How would you solve it? Sorry. No. The question is, what questions would you ask to try and solve this? And so they don't have to solve it for the individual, but it's around asking questions that these other expertise would ask to try and solve the problem. And so suddenly you're starting to narrow down your options. And so that that's where, yeah, it, it's, it's really important to distinguish between open and closed and some, and yeah, both have got very different objectives. From what I'm hearing, would it be quite logical then to go from open to close? Correct. So then you'd incorporate both essentially. You'd start off with getting as many ideas as you can through an open funnel. And then you have a red team that kind of shuts it down and you'd fight against to, to narrow it down to the, the most viable option. Exactly. Yeah. I personally love brainstorming as well. I think it's such a powerful tool, but I love the part of it where you can just allow any ideas to come through from anywhere. Because I think a lot of the time, personally for me, when I'm brainstorming with a team, I can see it, like the cogs move in the staff's head and they're quite closed minded. Like you can see that they're already starting to narrow down. Like you were saying, they're already moving towards a closed research technique because looking at how viable the option is of where I'm just like, wait, guys, come back, come back. I don't think about how viable it is yet. Let's just open up the funnel, bring in every idea from any industry, any experience you may have had or someone you might have seen a TV ad. It doesn't matter. Just bring it all in. We'll start funding it later. If you start red teaming it straight away, we can't, we can't get the ideas in the funnel. Totally uh, agree. Because it's like, it's almost, it, it is a very different mindset, right? With the open, you need to think big. You need to think aspirational, 
right? Think completely outside the box, which is quite foreign for some people. And so getting them as part of that process and getting them developing that soft skill, but being very definitive with what it is that we're trying to achieve versus closed where some people are not very good at it. Like they're big thinkers, but they're bad at thinking about problems or considerations, whereas people mm -hmm. are really good. And so not only can you help develop people to become better at either of those two things, you can actually also orchestrate it so that some people are just in team A versus team B and you'll get a better decision making mm. process along the way. Yeah. It's a great, great idea. Team A, team B. Um, you know, with your experience in omnichannel marketing and I'm curious this for myself as well, for small businesses with a lean budget, where would you recommend them start and build from? So there's multiple different channels, multiple different ways to approach this. But at the end of the day, yeah, you, you need to go, you need to chase the ROI, you need to chase the revenue. And ultimately, there's two, like the two best platforms. Actually, I'm going to assume that we're talking about B2C here, because I will talk about B2B separately. But B2C, what I mean by B2C is your e-com shops, right? So they're, you know, direct to consumer. There's really two major platforms for you, and that is Google text ads. So when you search into Google, an ad appears or Facebook slash Instagram, which are all housed on the Facebook ad manager. The, again, both very different in terms of their UI. And so if you're doing this DIY, it's quite cumbersome to learn both. Ultimately, the way you have to think about the major difference in Google and Facebook ads is Google, you're essentially casting out a net, waiting for a fish to come into that net either you're waiting for them to make a search. And the reason why Google ads are so powerful is because it tends to, once people are making that search, they tend to be ready to make a purchase. So your conversion rates typically should be higher, but there's lower search volume, right? That, because you need to wait for that person to make that search. Whereas with Facebook, someone doesn't need to make a search. The ad just appears in their feed. Same with Insta. They don't need to do a particular action on their behalf, they just need to get on the app and need to scroll through. And that's what makes it so powerful because you can amplify so much quicker. And so really, if I was to break it down, obviously it's a case by case basis, but ultimately Facebook, Insta and Facebook remarketing in particular, which all house them the same thing. You can just learn one platform and manage all three of those big campaigns to get the quickest ROI. Now you could argue depending on your audience. So, you know, Facebook and Instagram is very good for over 35 year olds. Insta is good for all age ranges. If your product is targeted under 25s, TikTok and Snapchat are really good. Now they all pretty much have the same concept in terms of there's an ad manager. You have an audience setting that you choose based on interest and behaviors. You upload an ad headline image and you publish it. They all function pretty much the same. But I think, I think, I know that typically it's better to start with Facebook ad manager because it's more versatile. There's a lot more education around it. And that's how, yeah, that, that's essentially where I'd start. Right. I think, yeah, I think those are definitely the go to's in terms of Google, Facebook, and Insta. But if you've broken it down in a way that it will help people buy their target audience a bit better, whether it's a certain age group or, where they want to cast a wider net or they want to play with retargeting game. But the Facebook manager, I think it went through a revamp recently as well with the whole interface. It's lots, there's lots in the back end there for people to look at and have a play with. I think so. And sorry, Kevin, I, I also want to add. So, so then you also have, so if you're a small business owner or launching a business, you'll also hear about SEO. SEO is a really powerful channel where essentially building up your rankability and your recognition of your website to Google. And you're driving organic traffic there. So back to that search component, but instead of the ad, people are finding you organic. SEO is fantastic. It's got a really high conversion rate. People are finding you of their own accord, but it honestly takes months for you to rank to get, get good traction. So if you're just starting out where cash flow is king and you want quick wins, you have to advertise. You can work on SEO in the background. But if you just focus on SEO, unless you've got the cash flow to support it, where you're going to be in negative for 
depending on your on, on the keywords you choose, it could be it's minimum three months, could be six, could be twelve, depending on how competitive your keywords are. And ultimately, the keywords you choose and their and the intent behind them is really important. Are they transactional? Are they informational? Are they actually going to be bringing people that are ready to buy, or are they just looking for information? Because the transactional keywords are the ones that are attract ready to buy audiences. I don't want to say all, but a majority of them are already being already being recognized by other websites. Unless you've yes. created a new sub niche category, which if you have, fantastic, then you're probably okay. But that's quite rare now. And so, for these small businesses that go out and they're they're joining the digital game, they're creating these campaigns or creating these ads. Besides from the metric of actually conversion, making money, what other ROI metrics would you recommend the small business focus on? Yeah. So the way that we break this down at Ooze is that there's three tiers of metrics. Tier one, the most important is ROI times revenue. And what I actually did a separate video on this, on the fact that I believe there's actually three different ROIs that you can look at. And it's all about time scale. So you need to look at the immediate impact of your marketing, which is looking at the ROI in the last 30 days from marketing. And so that has that basically you can attribute to the direct impact on your cash flow. Then you need to look at your ROI based on onboarding value. So your onboarding, your onboarding timeline is up to you. Some companies it's 30 days, some companies it's 90 days, but it's essentially from day one through to, I'm just going to use 90 days through to day 90. What is the onboarding value of your new customer? How are you treating this stranger that's purchased a product from you? How are you treating them? Are you treating them like your best friend? Are you giving them an absolutely incredible personalized experience and service? Because we've seen there's a direct correlation to how much money they spend with you in the first 90 days to how much they're going to spend with you in the first year. So the more emphasis you put on an amazing customer journey and experience, the more they'll spend with you and in the short term as well as long term. And so then what is the ROI based on the marketing expenses that happened that were used to acquire that customer, which, which are obviously fixed because there's only a certain amount. So what, once they're acquired, then they go into, you'd hope to spend more over time. And so that's why your ROI, you should see increase as we talk about these time scales. So ROI based on 30 days, 90 days and 12 months. So how does that ROI change over time? Because if you just focus on ROI over 12 months, you're not thinking about the immediate cash flow impact and you're probably going to be killing your cash flow really quickly. So that first one's really important, but you also can't negate that long-term 12 month analysis as well, because ultimately that's what long-term business decisions should be based on, on let's just say it costs you a hundred dollars to acquire that customer. They spend $400 with you in the first month. So you got a rough ROI of 300%. In the three months, they spent $1,000 with you. So you've got a 900% ROI. But over the course of 12 months, they've spent $5,000 with you. So that means you've got a 4,900% 4, ROI. All right. And so you can't just look at the 300%. You also need to look at the 4,900%. Um, yes, yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you've mentioned you've written about this elsewhere, right? Or spoken about it elsewhere. Yes, yeah, so I made a video on it talking about these Great. three different ROIs. And I think it'll be nice to include that link into the show notes so that Thank people you. who want to a deeper dive, they can take a look at that. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's very important because I think people that are moving into this game and it's essential, like you have to create these ads, you have to create these campaigns to get the exposure out there to get that distribution out there or else you can't you know, everyone's trying to create this product and their service and they, they love what they do they're passionate about it. that's great but once they get it, trying to get it out there then it's a whole different ball game and that's why we need professionals like you guys t to help out because you guys understand the game right stop it kevin understand. stop it good man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right you guys understand the psychology and everything <laughs> but so i just touched there on on tier one so then you got tier, which is, which doesn't pay the bills because tier one pays the bills. That, that, that's why it's tier one. It's the most important, but ultimately 
if you just focus on that, you could not be understanding what's working and what is, what's not working and what is working within your campaign. That's where tier two is about your cost per lead and your cost per acquisition, because typically there, there could be a stepping stone of how they capturing leads before you sell to them. And then your tier three, that is like your CTR, your unique link ratio, your bounce rate, all things like that don't pay the bills. And so they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be the measure of a, of a successful campaign but they should be indicators to whether your campaign is tracking well to become a successful campaign. So the only measure for a successful campaign is tier one, but tier two and tier three are those stepping stones for you to understand are you on the right track. And so something that we calculated recently is in the eight years that we've been operational, we've done 40,000 hours worth of ads optimization. And so we know very quickly within a three or four day span, whether a campaign is working or not, whether an ad or an ad set or campaign, depending on the level, is working or not. And we know when to shut one down, optimize it, i.e. edit it, or to put more money behind it because it's tracking in the right way. But in those four days, they likely, I say likely, they, they could not have had any revenue, could not have had any leads, but we know from our tier three metrics benchmarks that campaign will work because it's tracking really well. And so for any business mm. out there, it's really important to, to set yourself benchmark, figure out, okay, this is where I want to be in two weeks time. Okay. So I want to have this much revenue to be able to do that. I need this many leads and I'm should be expecting this many visits to the website, this much bounce rate, this much cost, things like that. Just start with some assumptions. It's probably going to be wrong, but that's totally fine because at least then you've got some level of benchmark to then measure yourself against. Yeah, that's a whole different ball game. But a lot of friends, they create this campaign to drive in blindly, give it a go, put some money behind it. But then without understanding the tier two and tier three, they don't know whether they should put more money behind it or they don't know if it's you know, to keep going or not. And so they put a lot in blind, pay, blind faith. So it's great that I think the awareness that you've shared and get them thinking about or then they can all seek experts like yourself and go, man, I need help because clearly I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm trying, I want to do it, but it's crucial, right? Because you get to the point where you don't know, should I put more money behind this campaign or not? And these are some big decisions for a small business because that's their budget, right? Correct. Yeah. And it's, and if you're starting out, it's not easy. And if you're starting out and you have no idea, you got to really ask yourself, if I want to do this DIY, I like, you've got to do a course. There's just so many variables in there at the moment that it can be very headstrong and have a very clear idea about who your audience is and the exact messaging and go for it. But be realistic, set yourself as an example, you have $200 test budgets. So we'll have an idea of a new audience or a new way to segment the audience with a new message to attract that audience. And so we, we will run a campaign over a week for $200. And if we don't see the results we want, we kill it. Don't just keep on running the same thing over and over again, hoping that things will change. You don't see positive tier three or tier two results in a week. So something's wrong. And so restart, rehypothesize. And again, we'll, we'll always come back to that journey. You've got audience, ad, landing page, conversion, event. So in your ads, have you got high CTR? If you do, then the audience and ad correlation is strong. However, let's say your bounce rate is really high. Let's say your bounce rate is hundred percent. Therefore, you know that your ad to landing page relevance is very low because people are clicking on it, but like they're seeing the ad messaging is clearly engaging with them. But when they get to the landing page, they're not converting and they're about and they're leaving straight away. So that, that would tell me either, yeah, your message on your ad and landing page aren't matched or ultimately the audience doesn't really care about the message and the product that you're offering on the landing page. So therefore you need to change the audience, you need to change the ad. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Very valuable information here I, that I'm gaining a lot of value from it. I'm sure the audience will as well. And then they can look up your, the video 
to understand more about the tier two, tier three that we'll share in the show notes. Thank you. Jesse, obviously you have a, an accomplished team and from the journey we've shared, we've spoken about so far, a ser- like an accomplished series of events as well. I'm sure it hasn't always been this way. Do you have a favorite failure that has set you up for later success? Yes, this was, this is quite a personal, no, not personal, but personal to ooze. And it's not something I've talked about before, but we had a bad probation pass rate. So from new team member arriving through to the success or the chance of them passing probation was low about three years ago. So we couldn't figure out why. Was it the recruitment? Was it the filtering? Was it the culture? Was it, was it me, the leader? Was it team? We just couldn't quite work out why. And we realized it was that we hadn't truly defined expectations of new team members. And we were trying to create a culture of autonomy without any guidelines. So we could basically essentially hired someone and expected them to start running straight away right? Which is just not fair. It's not practical. And so that's where we started to really build out what is the employee life cycle look like at Ooze. And so really building out each stage of the journey, everything from that very first touch point when they see the job ads and the job profile through to onboarding, through to probation pass, and then on to career development and things like that. And Ultimate, we now have a really, really hands-on induction period for two weeks where there's a really strong emphasis on multiple touch points every day because most likely they're remote. And so just making sure that they have everything they need, making sure that they feel comfortable to ask questions, making sure that they understand everything that has been thrust upon them, right? Because as we all know, when you start somewhere new, there is information overload. And so instead of just expecting the individual to relearn everything, we make sure that the really important points are communicated multiple times because that's the only way that it really sticks. And so making sure that they are fully integrated because only then can we truly expect them to be autonomous. Can we truly empower them to really know and understand what it is to be an ooze team member know and understand what is expected for them from them from the team as well as the role itself and the stakeholder whether it's the client or another team member and so that Mm. big switch of clear macro micro definitions like i was explaining earlier through to having a really good onboarding experience through to weekly mentoring and connected to career development. And that's really fixed that pass rate. That's an interesting one, the life cycle. I, th- the, I think it's very important to think about actually, to really consider the from beginning to end, how they'll be inducted in. And I think especially with a company like yours, where you've got very clear outlines of your vision, mission, purpose, and the, the discs that keep going all the way in understanding and connecting between the macro and the micro, it's important that they get touched with that multi, at multiple points so they can really absorb and understand and, as you said, understand what it means to be an ooze team, an ooze team member. I think a lot of comp- other companies can learn from that whether no matter how big or small you are, it's an important point to implement. That's it. Like the, they, they were just what killed us, like kills, not killed, that's a bit of a strong word, but what really negatively affected this whole thing is assumption. We, we just made too many assumptions. And instead of being guides, we were, what's the word? Just very hands off. What's a good word for a very hands off guide? <laughs> the opposite to a hands on guide. <laughs> I can't think of a, 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 a good metaphor. But yeah, just that, that big switch of, and again, like how, how can we present ourselves as caring when we're not investing that time in, in, in the initial phase? But again, it wasn't because we didn't care. 
we didn't invest the time. We just, we just wanted them to be autonomous from the very beginning, which is just a ridiculous concept in hindsight. But the time it made sense is we hired you, the, you're the expert, run free, be wild, do what it is you do best. But then when they don't know what to do and like how we operate and what makes us individual and what makes us different, that's very hard to do. That's true. But, and I also think you're not alone. A lot of companies hire people and they're like, run with it. Let's go from the get go with that. And kind of expecting them that they know exactly what's running through your mind and what you should be doing or this kind of thing. But the, everybody needs a bit of development because everyone's culture is a bit different. So how you want them to run is going to be a little bit different. There's, there, there's um, a really, sorry, a really, really okay. good employee handbook example. And that is Valve as in the game, the gaming developer Valve, the one that did half What's it called? What's that game called? Half, Half Life. Half Life. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, their handbook is. It, it has been. We found through our research, being pointed out a few times, is a really good example of a good employee handbook. It details what you should be feeling at the beginning on day one, what you should be feeling at the end of your first month. It's really important, right? So, short day one, it's scary. There's information overload. Again, that connection, that empathy, relate to them. And at the end of the first month, you should still be getting to grips with all the tasks, but you should be feeling more confident to ask your team member for information and questions, right? Drill down into how you feel like they should be feeling to help them understand the markers. That's something else that I'll probably look up. Great recommendation. Uh, I'll look up that employee handbook. Maybe I can put that in show notes as well for people to check out. And that's not something that I've ever thought about in terms of thinking about how my employees will feel this stage versus that stage. So that's an interesting insight. Another golden nugget from Jesse. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Hey, we've reached the tail end of the conversation. I normally ask all our guests a couple of questions. So here we go. Jesse, do you have any morning or evening routines? Yes, morning. So every morning I do 10 minutes of meditation, 10 minutes of yoga, and five minutes of, depending what you want to call it. I don't, I don't know why I'm so at, anti, but the word journaling, I've got a problem with. I find that it's got too many definitions and meanings. But what I do is I spend five, five to 10 minutes writing what hurdles are in my way to help me achieve my six to three, sorry, my three to six month goals. Because after meditation and yoga, I'm pretty zen, I'm chilled, I'm clear thinking. It's like, hey, I think about these medium term goals that I really want to achieve, whether it's personal or business, become a better tennis player or become better at yoga or through to learn this new skill, whatever it is, what is stopping me or what could stop me from achieving that? And I find just like writing the first stuff that comes to my head to be really therapeutic. And I find that it's really helped me overcome any surprises because nothing surprises me. That's a bit of a bold statement. Of course, I still get surprised <laughs> because I deal with humans I always have a surprising yes. element, but I, I find that yeah, I'm much more relaxed around surprises because I've thought about these different scenarios a lot. That's a great reflective question, actually. I'll definitely give that one a go. I have a play, see what comes up. <laughs> Do you have a favorite book you would recommend? Look, the book that started this all was The 4-Hour Workweek for me. The classic. Some verse. Yeah, genius. Like that, is it, was it pivotal and really important for me 10 years ago when I, when I launched put my first business? 100%. Is it still practical for someone that hasn't launched a business? I assume so. I don't know 100% sure, but the fact that it's still selling and it's still being talked about to me tells me that it is. The other book that I'd like to attach to it is The Tribe of Mentors. Same author, Tim. It's not a book and it's more of a dictionary or, right? It's pretty thick. It takes a few goes, but it's essentially like these golden nuggets from the world's best at every single industry you can think of. And not everyone will be relevant to you, but there are just some really inspiring quotes, stories, facts, methods that I think is relevant to everybody. E everyone from what, no matter what position, whether you're working or not working, really relevant. Yeah, I'm with you. That's the trial mentors is my most gifted book so far. I not surprised. I'd love to give it out. So, yeah, it's great. Are there any new beliefs or behaviors that have had a positive impact in your life in the recent years? Yeah, look, the, my morning routine, really, honestly, that I'd, I'd started doing that. Started doing that 12 months ago as, as part of a daily routine. And that's had a profound effect. Clear focus. There's been pretty big things that have happened in my life that have really affected 
me and I found that these, yeah, that morning routine really helps reset and something that I'm a big advocate for and something that we're, that we're calling our employee handbook is how to win every day. And so I really wake up with every day. I want to make sure that I smash my, my tasks. So I set myself achievable tasks, but also aspirational, but do this on a daily basis. And I really like to go to bed every night knowing that I've done the best I could. And that morning routine is the foundations for that. Yeah. And finally, Jesse, how can people reach out or learn about everything that you do? Well, look, go to oozestudios.com.au. So O-O-Z-E, you can probably see it slightly backwards here, but find me on LinkedIn. I'll send you the link. But I'm very prominent on LinkedIn. But yeah, you can also check out our website, which is a is like my puppy. It's like this thing that, that, that has cultivated and grown over the years and pretty unique and yeah, really like how it's developed. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jesse. I'll definitely include that in the show notes for everyone to access. Mate, again, appreciate your time. So many golden nuggets in this episode. Can't wait to review it all and lots to study, put it that way. <laughs> thank you, buddy. Kevin, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the show. All the links to the show notes will be available at kevinleysocial.com, spelled K-E-V-I-N-L-Y. Conversely, if you have any interviews that you'd love to recommend, please send it over to kevinleysocial at gmail.com. I'd love to connect. Thank you. Until the next episode.